Open your Bibles to Genesis 13. I, I, I had not planned to preach what I'm going to preach today. Uh, it kind of picks up where I left off last week. But all week long as I've been preparing my heart and as I've been trying to, to discern God's will and, and uh, determine what he wanted me to say today, he wouldn't let me leave this. He just kept bringing it back, bringing it back. And, and uh, I've learned enough to know that when God does that, you need to pay attention. Um, we are going to suspend our study of his story for a while, the next few weeks, and just do something different for, for at least a few weeks. But this kind of ties into what I left off with last week. Last week I talked about a very ugly scene in Scripture. The Israelites who had been delivered from bondage in Egypt by the Lord. They had been spared from, from Pharaoh's army that was pursuing them, wanting to kill them, had miraculously crossed the Red Sea on dry ground because of a miracle that God had performed. They had seen the same Egyptian army uh, destroyed, wiped out. All of them were killed in that very same Red Sea. They had eaten the manna that God had provided day after day after day. They had all drunk water from the rock that God had provided. God had provided miracles uh, uh, just continuously. He had miraculously taken care of them, and yet the Israelites failed to trust God to help them enter into the promised land. They were that close, but instead all of them died in the wilderness because of their disobedience. How, how does that happen? This wasn't the first time that God's people had made poor choices. Uh, or made poor decisions, and, and of course, it wouldn't be the last. Back in the book of Genesis, God had called Abraham to leave where he was, his home country, and go to a land that God had promised, I will show it to you, I will let you know when you get there. Just get up and start walking. And Abraham obeyed. He did exactly what God told him to do. Abraham and Sarah took with them Lot, who was Abraham's nephew. They uh, were following God's will. They were following him faithfully. They were being obedient to God's call on their lives. And over time, God miraculously blessed both Abraham and Lot, so much so that they needed to part company in order to provide enough grass and water for their multiplying herds and flocks. God just heaped blessings on them. Abraham gave Lot the opportunity to choose his land first. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 9, he tells him, If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. You choose. And then look in verse 10. Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of Jordan towards Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. And then there's a little parenthetical statement here that says, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did the Lord destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? It's, it's going to be later in the story, but why did that happen? Because wickedness and homosexuality were rampant. In both cities. Well, verse 11. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men, Abraham and Lot, parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain, and notice this, and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. So Lot pitched his tent near Sodom. He didn't, he didn't move into the city yet, just near it. 
But just one chapter later, in chapter 14, we see that Lot is now not only living near the city of Sodom, he has actually moved into town. And then in Genesis chapter 19, not only is Lot living in the city, but he is now sitting at the gate of the city. Chapter 19, verse 1. This is where the city business is taken care of. This is where the court of law happens. And Lot had become one of the city leaders, one of the the city fathers. If he had just been a regular resident, he wouldn't have been sitting there. Instead, he would have been standing near the gate. But all of the city fathers had a place to sit near the city gate. So Lot has become one of them. And God, later on, God sent two angels to Lot to get his family out of the city before God rained down fire and brimstone and destroyed that city. And the men of the city came and surrounded Lot's house that evening, pounding on the door and demanding that he turn over these two men that had come to him. These angels evidently looked like men. And they demanded that he turn over these two angels so that they could have sex with them. Chapter 15, or excuse me, chapter 19, verse 5. But Lot begged them, please don't do this terrible thing. And then he offered them an alternative. Listen to this, chapter 18. 19 verse 8. Look, he says, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under my, the roof, uh, excuse me, under the protection of my roof. Remember the progression. Think about this. First, Lot moved near the city of Sodom. And then he moves into the city of Sodom. And then later on, he became one of the leaders of the most wicked city that history has ever known. And finally, this guy is offering his own two daughters to the wicked men of the city to do whatever you like with them. Now, here's my question for you. How can a father fall so low as to offer his own two daughters to these wicked men? How can that possibly happen? How can a man who is supposed to love and worship God make such a terrible choice. How does something like that happen? The answer is, it happens a little at a time. This kind of fall takes place in small increments. I mentioned this last week, but the Lord just kept bringing it to my mind. It happens in small increments, a a decision here, a choice there, doing something dumb over here, and little by little we find ourselves in, in such a deep spiritual hole that we can't climb out. Now please understand this. When we feel far from God, God has not moved. Let that sink in. When we are far from God, it is not because he has moved. It's because we have strayed away from him and his will. As we saw last week, it's a slow fade. Most people don't destroy their lives in a single day. Most people don't destroy their lives by a single decision. But it it happens over time In small steps. 
not all at once. And those to whom it is happening can rarely see that it's happening in their lives. They rarely even notice it, but others standing on the outside looking in can see it coming. And it takes place in what's, what are seemingly insignificant decisions and choices and actions. Listen, folks, that's how our relationships break down. It's that little decision to say something mean or hurtful instead of speaking truth in love. That's how, that's how families are broken apart. It's that small decision to place my me time over the time with, or, or my personal hobbies and that sort of thing over the time of being together as a family and nurturing those relationships. Listen, that's how marriages crumble. It's a small decision, just a little decision, to flirt just a little bit with someone at work or, or even, even spend time uh, flirting with someone here at the church, for crying out loud, that leads to trouble and conflict in the home. That's how friendships are destroyed. It's that small decision to spread gossip about someone or to, to say something or, or, God forbid, post something on social media that damages someone and their reputation or hurts their feelings. And that's how our personal walk with the Lord breaks down as well. It's that small decision to neglect our personal time with the Lord, to neglect our time of prayer, to just brush it off as if it's unimportant. Oh, I'll do that later. And it happens also when we choose to do something else with our Sundays instead of focusing on worshiping God and being faithful to His church. It doesn't happen all at once. But little by little and slowly and gradually over time, and it continues until that person is far from the Lord and feels completely lost and completely alone. But it, it, again, it doesn't happen over, uh, overnight. It's a slow fade that leads to spiritual death. And it, it starts when we pitch our tents toward the world. And when we pursue things of this world instead of pursuing God. And we need to constantly be on guard against slipping back into our old worldly ways, into the things that we were saved out of. So I want you to notice the progression. Listen, I really feel like the Lord has called me here today to warn some people to wake up. All right? That's, that's what this is all about. Open up your eyes and see where you're headed. Don't let Satan have victory. Don't let Satan get a foothold in your life. Don't let Satan win. Wake up and see where you're going. Notice the progression in the lives of Abraham and Lot. First of all, Abraham saw by faith what God had promised. Didn't see it with his eyes, but he saw it by faith. Lot only saw what was pleasing to his eyes, the well-watered plain. Abraham chose to trust God by faith to see with spiritual eyes the promises that God was going to fulfill. Lot only chose what was pleasing to his own eyes. Abraham lived where God had called him to go. In Canaan, Lot chose to live near what looked good to him at the time. Abraham pitched his tent in Canaan toward the promises of God. Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom away from God and his promises. Abraham moved closer to God. Lot moved farther away from God. 
Abraham became an influencer for God, and Lot became a leader in the wicked city of Sodom. Abraham, in time, received a great reward. God's promises were fulfilled in his life, and Lot received the loss of earthly treasure because all his stuff burned up in Sodom. So you see how Abraham gradually, steadily progressed upward toward God, and Lot gradually, steadily progressed downward away from God and away from the things of the Lord. But notice that the beginning of the whole thing, the beginning of the downfall, this downward progression for Lot began with what he saw. The things that he saw. He made his choice and continued to make decisions based on what his eyes could see. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Remember a lady in early in the book of Genesis who was tempted by the snake in the Garden of Eden. And she saw that the forbidden fruit looked good for food. And then she took it. Then she ate it. Then she gave it to her husband. The same kind of downward progression. On the other hand, Abraham made his choices based on the promises of God and only what he could see by faith. Not with his physical eyes, but what could be seen by faith. Abraham saw with spiritual eyes and made his choices by faith. Listen, folks, that's how we need to live. Amen? That's, that's how we need to live. Lot is a classic example of a God follower who can have his or her life turn in a negative direction, away from the Lord. All of Lot's treasures were earthly and they were burned up and destroyed. Genesis chapter 19 tells us this. Lot's wife died because of her love of the city of Sodom. Again, chapter 19, verse 26 Abraham, or excuse me, Lot's own daughters got him drunk and committed incest with him. And his final days were pitiful living in a cave. It is a sad, sad story. If you are a believer, I encourage you to learn a lesson from Lot. Listen, choosing the path that leads you away from God and away from righteousness and away from the things of God always brings disaster and always brings punishment. Maybe not immediately, but it always leads in that direction. Don't let Satan fool you into thinking you can sin and get away with it because you cannot Don't let Satan wreck your life. Listen, judgment will come. And I say that brokenhearted. I'm not happy about it, but listen, judgment will come at some point. Instead, I beg you to to follow the pattern of of Abraham's life and, and, and choose a life of faith in God. Choose to obey him and do what is right. Obey him in all things. And when we do, blessings will come. Now, I'm not one of those guys that says, oh, you just name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. Uh, that that uh, once you get saved, that God's just going to dump out uh, buckets of money on you. The scripture doesn't say that anywhere. And the people who tell you that it says that have never read it. But God's blessings will be on your life. God's word does say that. So live a life of faith. If you're not a believer, learn a lesson from Abraham and start living your life by faith in God and start today. Because faithfulness to God brings blessing and reward. You may feel like you've gone too far. You may feel like you, there is no way that God could ever forgive you. You've done so many bad things that God is never going to give you another break. But I assure you that you can start over fresh and new today now. Amen. Amen. Maybe you have made a mess of things in your life. 
And, and maybe you've tried to do things in your own way and do things in your own time, and it has turned out to be a train wreck. Listen, there is still hope for you. There is still hope. I've asked one of our young men to come and share with you a bit of his testimony about his life over the past few years. I I want you to listen intently to what Brock Griminger has to say. Mark, he'll use this mic, okay? Brock? This is tough. This is not my comfort zone. But... From the get go. I was raised in church. At a young age, I kind of decided that I really didn't need it. Years went by. And God just continued to bless me. I didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But now down the road, I'll get back into church. I'll find a place. I'll go. Never happened. Never happened. Like Kurt said, you know, there's small decisions leading up. Just from here to here to here. You think you're climbing, you're just falling. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This would be huge for me. About a year and a half ago, I was in a spot where both my vehicles were broke down. My furnace went out. has literally not been that cold that winter in years. I was completely helpless and had no clue what I was going to do. How was I going to afford it? How could I fix this? Well, I was able to borrow some space heaters from some family members to keep my family warm. God bless me again. My next issue was getting my, at least one of my vehicles running. So I called my mechanic. He assured me that he would get my car running and he'd make way for me to pay for it. You know, at this point, I'm overcome with joy and thankfulness. All of my, all of my emotions poured out as I explained what I'm going through at this time. He calmly and softly says, (laughs) he says, Brock, you have to give those problems to God. First Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I said, you're right. It had been building up for years. And I finally let it go. He talked me through one of the most difficult times in in my life. Then God helped me pay for my car. Then through my parents, helped me to fix and pay for my furnace. After these incidents, I told myself, no more, no more of the past. No more drinking alcohol to try and fix, you know, temporary easement of pain. No more vulgar language. And inappropriate jokes and crude humor that you develop over time in, you know, bad situations, maybe a bad workplace. So my family and I reached out to an old friend and started attending Fellowship Church. I no longer feel helpless. I fall, I fall short. Every single day. 
but it's okay. Because God sent Jesus to die on the cross for all of our sins. And all we have to do is trust in him and follow him. I have never felt joy like I felt over the last year and a half. It's unbelievable. You can't describe it. My son says it best. We see a beautiful sunset. We're driving down the road. Carson looks out the window and goes, Dad, how can someone not believe? I'm like, you're right, buddy. Only God can create something so beautiful. I'm like, you... This past summer at church camp, he accepted Jesus into his heart. Man, you talk about a proud daddy. Wow. You know... What I've been able to do over the last year and a half is crucial. My kids needed me. They needed this dad. They needed this one that knows he's wrong and that knows he suffers, but knows that he's saved by God's grace. And knows that he's forgiven, that God loves him and forgives him. I had no idea why I was up here today. But these tears are tears that I just hope everybody realizes are real. You go so long in life saying, I'm tough, I'm rugged. Yeah, nobody's going to see me cry. No, that's embarrassing. But until I gave it all to God and gave him all my problems and all my struggles, I was never able to experience that kind of peace. And now, through our new church's motto, I get to experience my greatest joy in Jesus every week. So, I'm sorry. I couldn't hold it together, but it's a good feeling, and thank you all for listening. Thanks, Brock. Listen, God's plan of salvation is as easy as ABC. The A is you have to admit that you need the Lord. You you just have to man up and face it, admit that you're a sinner and that you can't save yourself. The Bible says that we're all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. And it also says there's a punishment for that sin. The wages of sin is death. So admit that you need the Lord. And then believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross in your place to pay for your sins. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God demonstrated his love to us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Believe that Christ died for you. And then the C is just confess that Jesus is Lord and make him Lord of your life. I want to share a passage of Scripture, Romans 10, starting with verse 9, says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And then verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God offers forgiveness and grace. He offers the gift 
of salvation and the gift of eternal life to anyone who will receive it. It's, it's there. It's yours for the taking. But that gift will never be yours until you reach out and take it. But you can do that today. You do that by simply coming to God in repentance and in faith and saying a prayer, something like this. It doesn't have to be these exact words, but something like this. Lord, I admit my sins to you, and I'm sorry for my sins. I believe that Jesus paid the punishment for my sins when he died on the cross. And I ask you, God, to forgive my sins and to wash them away and make me a brand new person today. I place my trust in you, admitting that I can't save myself. I need you to forgive me and save me. Are you willing to pray a prayer like that? I invite you to come to the altar today and receive Christ. And if you're already a Christian, but you feel like you've made such a mess of your life and you, you realize that you, you, you're taking the wrong steps and going the wrong direction, I've got another verse for you. It's 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that says, If we who are believers, it's, it's right, he's written to believers, it's written to believers, if we confess our sins that he is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, forgiveness of sin is available to you today. Salvation is available to you today. I invite anyone and everyone, come to the altar and receive those things from him. Let's bow for prayer.